So far, I have shown you that proteins have many ways of being classified and that it's impossible to have one perfect way of classifying them. You can classify them by shape, by composition, and by function. And I did mention a little bit about native conformation, wherein proteins are only functional when they are in their native state. That will have some importance later. I also made sure that we know the fundamental structural basics of any peptide, that regardless of how short or how long a peptide is, there will always be composed of amino acids connected by peptide bonds, wherein one end is the N terminus, one end is the C terminus, and that we call individual amino acids in the peptide chain as residues. Now, if you look at the structure here of a peptide, it follows a linear format. It's just like a straight line from the N terminus to the C terminus, like that. But, of course, you can ask the question again, isn't it that we have proteins that are globular? So why is it possible that something that forms a straight line can be something spherical? And uh, a question like that can be answered by the fact that proteins can actually increase their levels of organization such that their structure becomes more and more complicated the more interactions you consider in the entire peptide chain. And so this allows me to welcome to you the levels of organization for peptides. There are four levels of organization, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And as you go from left to right, the level of complication becomes even higher. That means that the primary level is the most simple of the levels of organization. And actually, the thing that you're seeing here, wherein I have my amino acids connected by peptide bonds forming a linear chain, just like imagining you imagining some kind of thread or wire without any uh, pattern at all, that's the primary level. So basically, we can see that the primary level is just the sequence of amino acids from the N terminus to the C terminus, and they most likely take on a linear structure, which actually isn't that complicated at all. All right? Now, if ever you can imagine some of the residues here, amino acids here interacting, it could actually go higher to the secondary level. And there are two main representative secondary structures of proteins. Those which are helical shaped are called the alpha helices. And those which take on some kind of wavy shape are called the beta sheets or beta pleated sheets. They're called pleated because it's as if they look like pleats in clothes. Alright, so let's try to look further into their structure so you can just imagine this zooming to something like this one. So I start at the N terminus, then one amino acid, then another, then another, forming some kind of spiral or helix uh, shape. And then notice I didn't uh, go further. You can just imagine that uh, sooner or later it will end at the C terminus. All right. So here, there are just uh, some terms that I would like to show you because most texts also uh, uh, name them. For example, the distance or the height between these two amino acids is called a rise. And the distance between, let's say, this amino acid and then one amino acid after one complete turn, like this one, is called a pitch. Okay, And uh, that's it about alpha helices. Now, also, you might want to ask, why do we even have an, a helix here in the first place? Now, to answer that, let's go back to the structure of a peptide. Isn't it that a peptide bond will always have a carbonyl group? and this oxygen is expected to be partially negative. And then the amino group's hydrogen, since it's connected to the nitrogen atom here, it's going to be partially positive, right? So you can imagine that, you know, let's say I have a C double bond O here, and then I have here an NH. This is partial positive, partial negative. There could be a potential interaction here. Remember, this is called a hydrogen bond simply because the partial positive uh, uh, charge is from a hydrogen. And therefore, we can actually say that regular, of course, I'm not being accurate in the way I'm drawing it, but you can just imagine that regular hydrogen bonds spaced evenly will give us this helical shape 
from the original thread-like or linear shape. But a helix is not the only shape that we can have in the secondary level, such as this one. The beta pleated sheets can be drawn in detail like this. So one of this would be this one, and then the other one is this. So you can see here that I already drew it in color red. I already showed here the H that's partially positive and the O that's partially negative, forming the hydrogen bond, which is actually the same thing that I explained in the alpha helix, which just means that in the secondary level, the reason for both the formation of the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet is the hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond is initiated by atoms of the peptide bond. The CO comes from the peptide bond. This NH also comes from the peptide bond. So those are the only atoms involved in the secondary level. There are actually two uh, subtypes of beta pleated sheets. The sheet here, drawn in white, is called a parallel beta pleated sheet because we both start at the N-terminus at one end and end at the C-terminus at the other. The other one here, drawn in yellow, is called anti-parallel because one peptide here starts at the N-terminus, but the other peptide chain starts at the C-terminus, and basically it's as if they run in opposite directions. There is a difference in the way their hydrogen bonds are uh, expressed or, or, or positioned. The hydrogen bonds in the parallel sheets are kind of diagonal, which, kinds of, which kind of weakens the bond. But here you can imagine that a straight hydrogen bond going through the entire composition of the atoms that make the hydrogen bond are actually stronger compared to these ones. So the anti-parallel is actually relatively more stable than the parallel beta pleated sheets. And in fact, they are also the more common type of beta pleated sheet found in nature. Now let's go to the tertiary and you can just imagine these helices and sheets can further even associate have additional interactions. So now you may ask, we already had a peptide bond, right? The primary level is all about the peptide bond linking amino acids together. And then on top of the peptide bonds, we added the hydrogen bonds positioned in such a way that we get helices or sheets. So what now do we expect to be added on top of peptide bonds and H bonds in the tertiary level? Those are actually what we call the residue interactions. And take note that I'm using the word residue here referring to the R groups of the individual amino acids. So for example, I have here one long chain. This is the N terminus. This is the length of the peptide. This is the C terminus. There are some amino acids that, you know, at one point would face each other and can actually have some kind of interaction. For example, I have a phenylalanine here, letter F and valine here. Now, if you review our amino acids, both of them are actually nonpolar. And basically, if I have two nonpolar residues, all of them are carbons, right? They can have some kind of van der Waals interactions or London dispersion forces, which are actually often uh, written in biochem textbooks as hydrophobic interactions. So this is just another term for the London forces exhibited by close or nearby uh, nonpolar amino acid residues. And I think it makes sense because nonpolar residues are hydrophobic. Okay, next, electrostatic interactions are basically um, dipole dipole forces, um, but uh, not really dipole dipole. I think a better, better um, word than dipole dipole is ionic. And uh, I'm saying this because, for example, I have your letter D, which is actually our uh, amino acid, aspartic acid. And uh, we know that at a certain pH, aspartic acids R group can ionize to become negative. And then R, which is arginine, has an R group, which is a, at a certain pH could have a charge of positive. So in the case that both the negative and positive charges exist, this negative, entire negative charge and this entire positive charge can interact, which is actually more similar to an ionic bond rather than dipole-dipole, which is just partial charges. Okay, so I think this would, this would be the better word. 
and uh, electrostatic interactions are therefore exhibited by uh, interactions of an acidic and a basic amino acid that are nearby. Disulfide bonds are special residue interactions and will only uh, involve two amino acids and no other pair, that is, a pair of two cysteine molecules. And I'm saying that there is no other possible pair because the only time that you can get a disulfide bond is if I have both the SH groups of cysteine. After a certain reaction, you can actually oxidize both of them. And uh, the context of the word oxidation here is the removal of the hydrogens in order for these two sulfur atoms to connect. And since there are two sulfur atoms from two different sustained residues that are connected, that gives uh, the definition or the prefix di in disulfide bonds. Of course, it's impossible for this to happen to any other pair because only sustained has the thiol group. And uh, therefore, these are things which you expect that make the tertiary level even more complicated than the secondary and primary. And you can just imagine, what if the, this happens... In, a, in such a complicated way that, you know, our peptide chain just goes crazy and forms some kind of shape like this. And uh, therefore, I'm saying that, you know, this is somehow like a, sh a sphere. This is actually the reason why it's possible for us to have a globular protein. You can just imagine all the residues interacting in such a way they form that shape there. But it's not yet over. We have an even higher level of organization, the quaternary level. And of course, you might ask, on top of peptide bonds, hydrogen bonds, and residue interactions, what else could we expect from a quaternary level? Actually, nothing else. It's actually the same interactions. But what makes quaternary higher than the tertiary in the first place? It's the fact that in the quaternary level, you have two or more peptide bonds strands. I want you to remember that when we were talking about the tertiary protein or the tertiary structure, we're only talking about one strand. You know it's a single strand because it only has one N terminus and it ends in the C terminus, so it's, this is just one single thing. But you can just imagine, what if I have a globular protein here with its own N terminus and its own C terminus somewhere, and then another protein which has its own terminus here, uh, and there, and then that happens to all of these four. Uh, four is just an arbitrary number, of course, it can be two or three or even five, okay? And what if these four individual peptides have their own residue interaction such that they all exist as one unit and function as one unit? That is the time we have a quaternary protein. Sometimes, since uh, one strand is just a part of the whole here, we can uh, call one peptide strand in this uh, complex as a subunit. So the only time we can expect to hear the word subunits are uh, or is when we have a quaternary protein. For example, this one is called a tetramer because this quaternary protein is specifically made up of four separate strands. Of course, if it's made of only two, you can call that a dimer, if three, trimer, and so on. A perfect example of a tetramer is actually hemoglobin. So when I, I was uh, telling you before that globin here is the protein of hemoglobin, I'm not actually just uh, saying there's one globin. There are four globin strands in hemoglobin. And again, just because we have more than one peptide strand, that way it makes the quaternary level higher. Than the tertiary level. Now, there are two words that we always have to take in mind whenever we talk about the levels of organization. These two words are denaturation and hydrolysis. These are actually two words that we can use to imagine our proteins having their uh, structure disrupted. So basically, these two words are related to the disruption of protein structure. Specifically, when you say denaturation, you are converting any of these three, tertiary, secondary, quaternary, into the primary level. So notice it ends here. So I'm saying that when you say denature the protein, you're actually disrupting the interactions present in that peptide or that protein such that they go back 
to the plain old linear structure. Okay? And uh, the word denaturation is actually related to the word native conformation. Because, for example, what if I say that you know, hemoglobin's native or, or functional form is when it's spherical and four of them exist? So if I denature them and all of these globular proteins start to become thread-like, and uh, of course you expect this will not have the function anymore, this will not be useful anymore, it has been taken away from its native state. And denaturation is a perfect word. De is to remove it. So denaturation literally means removal from the native state. But that doesn't mean that you're destroying the protein. You're just laying it out as a straight chain. But whenever you use the word hydrolysis in context, isn't it that when we use the word hydrolysis, we're referring to breakage of peptide bonds? I'm going to ask you, what's the only thing that makes up our primary level? That's right, peptide bonds. So meaning, if you can just imagine, these peptide bonds being cut one by one, what would happen? The result is, our final result or final product are individual amino acids. And isn't that hydrolysis? That's right. So whenever you want to say uh, that you want to completely destroy the protein to the point that they exist as individual amino acids, you don't use the word denaturation. You use the word hydrolysis. There are specific hydro uh, hyd hydrolytic agents, hydrolytic enzymes, denaturing agents that you will read in biochemistry texts, but I will not detail them out here. What matters at the moment is that you know the difference of these two words in relevance to the levels of protein organization.